Good morning, everyone. Shavua Tov. Welcome to our Parsha class. The parsha of the uh, double Parsha, the Tzavim and Vayelech. So we are towards the end of the Deuteronomy, end of the light, almost at the end of Moshe's life. In uh, the Kutli Chumash, we it begins on page 1316. It's two short portions. The Tzavim has 40 verses. Vayelech, which is the shortest portion of the Torah, has 30, sorry, has 80, I'm sorry, has 70? No, I, I was said it has 30. Together it has 70. So uh, even together, two portions together, it's still a pretty short parsha. Um, it was brought up before, why are certain parshas together? Why do we sometimes combine parshas and why, why are some parshas separate? Um, I think the basic explanation is that there, you know, we have a cycle, right? Uh, a, 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 a annual cycle, a yearly cycle, where we uh, uh, read the Torah every year from the beginning of the first Shabbos, called Shabbos Bereshis, after Simchas Torah. We begin with the first parsha, the parsha of Bereshis. And then we conclude on Simchas Torah with the parsha of the Zos Abracha, the final parsha. So the, during the year, every week we read one portion. However, there are some weeks where we don't read a, a, a regular weekly portion. Why is that? Because it's a holiday. It's a holiday, right? So on a holiday, when the holiday is on Shabbos, we read a holiday Torah reading. Obviously, it's from the Torah, but it's not from the regular Torah portion cycle. So for example, Yom Kippur, a few weeks, this year is on what day of the week? It's on Shabbos. So on Yom Kippur, we're not going to read the regular Torah portion. We're going to read the portion that we read for Yom Kippur. And if Shavuot ever, or Passover, or Rosh Hashanah, if any of these days is ever on Shabbat, we don't read the regular portion. So every year you got to look at the calendar. I mean, this is already done for you know years ahead, but like you got to look at the calendar and see, okay, what is what does this this, this year look like? How many weeks do we have? And then we got to figure out which parsha is read when. And sometimes you got to combine a few to make it work. And some of them are combined, some of them are not combined. We also have this idea that certain parshas are supposed to be read at certain times, like. Before Rosh Hashanah, we read Kisavo. Before Shavuot, we read Bechukotai. So we want to make sure that it all fits. And therefore, we sometimes we combine certain parshas. Happens to be with this parsha, the Tzavim Amayelach, is that whenever there is a Shabbos in between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, then these two parshas are separate. One of them is read before, one of them is read, one of them is read before Rosh Hashanah. And one of them is read after Rosh Hashanah. And then the next parsha, Hazinu, which is the second to last parsha, will be read after Yom Kippur. But if there is no Shabbos between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, then these two parshas are together. And then the Shabbos after Rosh Hashanah will be the second to last parsha, Hazinu. And then on Simchat Torah, we do the final parsha, Zot Bracha. So this year, Yom Kippur is not Shabbos. There is no Shabbos between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. And therefore, Nitzavim and Vayelech are combined in, in one Parsha. So as you mentioned, Moshe, it's already the last day. It's uh, the time to say his you know farewell is, is coming very close. Uh, the last Parsha of the Zosa Brochi gives his final, his final blessing. To all the Jewish people, to all the tribes, and here he finished. He's 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 continuing, you know, to talk to, to talk and to encourage Jewish people to follow in God's ways. And you can read it inside. It's a fascinating read. I want to focus on the end of his talk in the second portion, the parsha of Ayelach, where he encourages the Jewish people: "You go into Israel, be strong. Don't learn from the other nations." Right, kind of repeating this theme over and over again throughout the book of Deuteronomy. And over here, in the Parsha of Ayelach, he gives us the final two mitzvos of the Torah. 
How many mitzvahs are there? We know the number. What is it? 613. Just the other day, I get a call talking about a bris. Uh, baby is born. I said, what's the baby's weight? That's always one of my first questions. What was the baby's birth weight? What was it? 613. Like, oh, wow. What a Jewish boy. <laughs> 630 commandments. What is the last commandment that we have written in the Torah? In the parsha of Vayelach. There are two last commandments. One, the second to last commandment is the mitzvah of Hakhel, which is every seven years, the year after the sabbatical, the year after Shemitah, when all the Jewish people gathered together in the temple, holiday of Sukkot. We spoke about this last year because last year was on our calendar, the year of Hakel. And then the final mitzvah is a mitzvah that perhaps no one really knows about. And it is the mitzvah to write that each and every one of us, every individual Jew, should write for themselves a a Torah, a Torah scroll. Have you done that yet? Uh, have you written Have you written your Torah yet? Okay, so we're going to discuss this. What exactly you bought a a chumash, a book? So we're going to discuss what exactly is this mitzvah and how is it fulfilled today. We're going to read this inside. Let's jump to page 1332, 1333. Verse 19. Verse 19. We're in, if you have a different chumash, we're talking chapter 31 of Deuteronomy, chapter 31, verse 19. Moshe is speaking. I'm sorry. God is speaking to Moshe. This is God speaking to Moshe, talking about how he should encourage and what he what he should speak to the Jewish people, how he should uh, speak to uh, to Joshua, to Yehoshua, his successor, who will take the Jewish people into Israel. And make sure that they know that if they follow in God's ways, it all it will all be good. And unfortunately, if they don't follow in God's ways, it's not going to be good. And as a reminder to know that God spoke to us and warned us and told us we have to follow in his ways, verse 19, and now, write for yourself this song. Lambda as B'nai Yisrael and teach it to the Jewish people. Sima B'fihem, it should be placed in their mouths. Leman Tihi Ali, Hashira Hazois, Le'ed B'nai Yisrael. So that the song will be for me as a witness to the children of Israel. What exactly is this song? What song is he referring to? So you see, they have it here in the parentheses. It comes from Rashi. That has that the, the this song is the song of next week's parsha, which is the parsha of Hazinu, and one of the few songs that the Torah actually writes is the song of Hazinu. You can look at uh, page thirteen thirty nine. It's actually written in the Torah a little differently. It's written as a song. It's like a poem, and it's a song about God telling the Jewish people that you got to follow in His ways, etc. That's the Parsha of Hazin. So that song, which we will learn next week, this is the song that God told Moshe that he should write for the Jewish people. They should have it written down. However, Maimonides, and the uh, truth is the Talmud, it seems like, uh, derives from this verse, another mitzvah. And that is the mitzvah of writing the entire Torah down each, for each person. In other words, this song is not only referring to the song of Ha'azinu, but is referring to the entire Torah. We refer to the entire Torah as a song. Why are we referring to it as a song? Because perhaps 
song is something light, even a heavy song, but it's something that talks to you. It's a, you know, you can appreciate a song. And the Torah is something, something that we should appreciate. We should sing it. We should sing it. We should have a skip in a, 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 a the expression. Uh, uh, you know, we have a, a an excitement while we study Torah because it's not something that we just, uh, we have to coerce into, we have to do it. No, it's a song. Who doesn't like singing? I was uh, at a party last night. Uh, we have new neighbors here down the block and they invited me to put up some mezuzahs and I come in and what are they doing? Karaoke, they have a, the mic and they're singing songs, right? They're like, who doesn't like, who doesn't like to sing songs? So the Torah is uh, it's a song. That's what it is. The song of our soul. So uh, the Talmud tells us that Maimonides brings us, you know, brings it in his code of Jewish law that there is a mitzvah. And this is the final mitzvah that is given to us days before Moshe passes away. The final mitzvah is that each individual should write the entire Torah down and have a Torah scroll. Have their own Torah scroll. That's the mitzvah. And if you look at Maimonides, he lists the 613 commandments. It's in there. The same mitzvah that we have, put on tefillin, and keep the Shabbos, and blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, and shake the lulav on Sukkot, and eat kosher. All the mitzvahs that we have, one of them is, write a Sefer Torah. Each individual should write their own Sefer Torah. That's the mitzvah. And where's the verse? This is the verse. Write for yourself this song as a reference to the entire Torah, not only to the Parsha of Hazinu. Each individual has this mitzvah. Now, what's the reason for the mitzvah? You could say simply the reason is that we should have access to a Torah scroll to, to study. You should be able to study Torah, right? Back in the day, how would you study if you didn't have a Torah scroll? There was no prints, houses, there was no books. A book meant a scroll, right? That's how people wrote. They had a quill, they had a par parchment, and they wrote. So you got to write the Torah. You want to study Torah when you have it from memory. You got to write your own Torah so you have access. Whenever you want, you open the scroll at home and you study. So the question that perhaps you're thinking about is, why don't we know anyone who does this mitzvah? I know many, many religious people. I don't know anyone who wrote their own Torah for themselves to do this mitzvah. Right? It should be as a bar mitzvah gift. Instead of giving us a cheap uh, $20 sitter, we should get a $30,000 Torah scroll. <laughs> so if people will write a letter in the Torah. Oh. Write a letter. So there's this concept of writing a letter in the Torah. When you say writing a letter, what do you refer to? When you conclude a Torah, right? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. When the, Lance is, is pointing out that when we conclude the Torah, we honor some of the community members to come up and write one of the concluding letters, the last usually last two or three lines, they write a letter in the Torah. That is that is true. I mean, it's something which not everyone gets to do, but it's an honor if you're actually there when they conclude a Torah. Uh, but it's not writing a Torah. <laughs> it's writing a letter in the Torah. Is that the mitzvah? The mitzvah is to write a letter in the Torah? And who who owns that Torah? Is that your Torah to take home? Yeah. No. It's the community's Torah. But we're the public honor Oh, you're part of the community. Okay. Okay, good point. We'll get back to that. That's a good point. Michael's making, well, it's a community, so we're all part of the community. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Question? Okay. And the truth is, this is a question that the Rebbe actually spoke about this in the 80s. And he said that, you know, he, the Rebbe referred to himself, says, I come from a pretty religious family. And he says, my father was very, very religious. Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, Schneerson, the Rebbe's father, the rabbi, uh, the chief rabbi in the Ukraine, uh, in, in, uh, in the Yakutrinslav, in the Dnepr Petrovsk, as it was called then. Uh, very religious man. Very religious man. He says, I never even heard him talking about it. Never even mentioned that, oh, maybe it's because it's so expensive. I wish I had the money to put together to buy to, to write a Torah or to hire someone to write a Torah for me. It wasn't even something that it was discussed. And we know you look around, there are many people who are people of means, people who do could afford to spend 
the money to hire someone to write a Torah scroll. And there are people who actually are a sofer and, and they themselves are able to write a, a Torah scroll. And again, sometimes fi finances is not, is not a problem. But we still don't see people writing their own Torah scrolls, right? Even if they are able to do it. Of course, most of us, you can say, uh, this is one of the myths of that. It's too much, right? Each person to write their own Torah scroll. Who knows? We don't know how to write a Torah scroll. And to hire someone, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, most of us aren't, aren't able to do so. Okay, but there are many people who are able to do so. And maybe some of us, at a certain point in our life, now, if I knew that this was a thing, I would save up for it, right? I save up for a house. I can't, I can't afford a house, but, you know, you make it work, right? You save up for a house, you save up for a car, you save up for your children's weddings or their college, right? Certain things are important. They are priorities, so you say make it work. If I knew that as a religious Jew, I need to write my own Torah scroll, I'll figure it out. I'll make it work. I'm sure the industry will, will change, right? It'll be, uh, it'll be a lot cheaper. You can get, you know, pocket-sized Torah scrolls. I don't know, right? To the point that we're part of this community. And synagogues, in fact, I think we did it here, they hire, bring in the Torah to write a Torah, and it's the synagogue's Torah, and we all belong to the synagogue, so therefore, it's technically, it's our Torah, just like Rabbi Nemes said yesterday, it's our synagogue. Yeah. Okay, that's a very good point. So I think Lance and Michael are, are on to something. And they're saying that being part of the community and the community owns the Torah, that is something that already, uh, you know, perhaps is the way we could fulfill this myth. So that's a very good point, and we're going to get back to that in a moment. Halakhically, throughout, you know, history, there, there were those who spoke about this. Because Maimonides writes this in his Book of Laws, and he writes it very clearly, that there's a it's very, very absolute. There is a mitzvah to write, for each individual to write their own Torah scroll. So there, there was another great uh, uh, halakhic authority going back to, uh, to, to that, you know, to that era. We're talking about like the uh, 1100s, 1200s. Uh, Rabbi uh, Usher al fasi the Rosh, as they would call him, he writes something interesting. He says that this mitzvah was something that was only applicable back in the day. Because then, that was the only way to study. If you didn't have a Torah scroll, you couldn't you couldn't study, right? There was there were no paper, there were no books, so the mitzvah was you had to have access to the Torah. Don't rely on your memory, but each individual should have their own Torah scroll, so they should be able to study. But today we have books, we have libraries, and all you need to do is buy a good nechomish. That's all it is. 50 bucks. That's it. You're done. We all have books. And today, if you want to translate that to modern times, you have the internet. You have your phone. You go, you search online, and you get the entire libraries. Libraries of millions of books are all on this small little device. So the Torah is at your fingertips. So therefore, today, there isn't this mitzvah, per se, to write a Torah scroll. That's what the Rosh said. The Rosh said and it's brought down in the Code of Jewish Law, the Shulchan Aruch, that there is no mitzvah to write your own Torah scroll today because the mitzvah is make sure you have access to the Torah, whether it means buying books, and perhaps today it just means by having access online that you can study Torah. And by the way, there is this, uh, you know, the, the, the book, the, 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 the print the print book industry is not as as it used to be, right? Today, it's ebooks go online. You can, you can read articles, right? Who goes to libraries today? Everything's online. However, in the Jewish community, we know we're always going to be printing books. Why is that? Because one day a week we can go online. Shabbos. So, if you want to study, and, who, and Shabbos ends up being a, a big day of studying because we have, we're out of work and we have time and we study together. So uh, a shop is you need a book, you can't you can't go online. So there's always going to be at least in the Jewish world, there's always going to be books being printed. Uh, the Rebbe actually had a, a one of his campaigns in the '80s was that we should have a house filled with Jewish books, filled with holy books, just to have a have a, a, a your own little library. Everyone 
to decide how, how many books, whether it means five books or a hundred books or five hundred books. Uh, but there should be Jewish books in our home. We should, first of all, the books itself is it brings holiness to the house. It's also an opportunity to learn, study something. You have a few minutes, try to figure out what should I study. You go to you go to the shop, you pull out a book, you're able to study. So the Torah should be accessible. So back in the day, it was through writing a Torah scroll. And today it is by having books or having access to the Torah. However, that, 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 that isn't the complete answer because even, like we said, if you're going back 1,000 years, 1,500 years before there were books, we still don't really find this mitzvah being fulfilled. We don't really find that people, that Jewish communities had to say that every, every Jewish person wrote their own Torah. And the truth is that even today, right, if the mitzvah really is to write the own Torah scroll and it could be fulfilled through books, you, you would think that you would find some people who are still writing their own Torah. But you don't find that anywhere. So what the Rebbe said in this talk, which is fascinating, is really what Lance and Michael are, are talking about, is the power of a community, a community Torah. When the community comes together and purchases a Torah, and when we pray with it, and we read it publicly in the minyan, we call people up and they say a blessing over the Torah. Each individual has an ownership of that Torah scroll. It's not only that we have the opportunity to read from it whenever we want, but we have this connection to the Torah through being part of the community. Like Michael said, it's our community. It's not your community that I'm coming to pray in. This is our community. The community is made, it's made up, not by the rabbi and the president, it's made up by the by the community. It's by the, the members of the community. This is and when the community purchases a Torah or writes a Torah, now each individual has a part in this Torah. It becomes theirs. It's like a partnership. Right? What if two people want to write one Torah and each one pays 50%? Okay, so now you have your Torah, it's a partnership. But if it could be a partnership with a hundred people, it could be a partnership with a thousand people. Because if you're all part of the community, we all have stakes in the Torah. And through this, we fulfill our mitzvah. So yes, the, the, the spirit of the law is to have access to the Torah. And for that, we should not rely on being part of the community. We should make sure we have Torah books at home. We should make sure we have access to the, 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 the uh, online. We'll, ha however we, we, we study best, we should have that. But in addition to that, just being part of the community. That itself, uh, you know, gives us ownership of, of the Torah scroll. And this is how we fulfill the mitzvah today. And that's perhaps the reason why we don't really find throughout history that people were buying or, or writing their own Torah scroll because they were part of communities. And therefore, they fulfilled this mitzvah, which gives us some depth to the importance and the significance of being part of community. Being part of a community now, all of a sudden, became a mitzvah. It's the mitzvah of writing a Torah scroll is only fulfilled completely through being part of a, commu of a community. You know, there's once this guy who felt, ah, community, I don't need that community. I'm better on my own. I, I like, I'm not so social. I like to be kind of doing my own thing. I'll pray at home. I'll be able to study better. I'll be able to be a better Jew. Just being alone without any undisturbed. There's too many kids. The rabbit's trim is too long. I mean, all the chalk was burnt. All the reasons why we didn't like the community. I'm going to be at home and do my own thing and have my relationship with God individually. Well, the rabbi hears about this. And the rabbi decides he's going to pay him a visit. This is going back in the old shtetl. It was a cold winter night. The rabbi comes, knocks on the door, it comes to visit. Oh, rabbi, oh, he came to visit. Wow, so, so honored. Please come in. Warm yourself up by the fire by the fireplace. The rabbi sits down by the fireplace. Doesn't say a word. They're sitting there for a few minutes. They're looking at the fire, all the coals, the wood burning in the fireplace. The rabbi takes, I forget what it's called. What's that thing that you... The, the, the metal stick, the, the, the poker. 
the stoke and reaches into the fire and removes one small coal out of the big pile of coals and moves it to the side within the fireplace, moves it to the side, puts the stoke down. They watch for another two, three minutes. What happens? That little coal loses its flame. The rest of the fire is still burning. The rabbi didn't say a word, just got up and left. This guy, this person understood the message. When you're alone, standing alone, doesn't last long. The importance of being part of the community, there's a certain type of tree, I'm trying to remember now the name of the tree, I should have checked it up before the class, where it's a very weak tree. I don't know if they grow in New Orleans because it'll be, it'll be thrown down by a, 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 sm a small wind. Uh, uh, Francine is enough to throw that. And uh, it's very weak. And the roots don't go very deep. However, this tree, when it's planted together with other trees, they, they become the strongest trees. And why is that? Because their roots tend to intertwine and kind of get all into each other. So even though the roots are not deep, but the roots kind of meet with each other's, and therefore together, it's impossible to uh, to knock it down. Is it a cypress? No. I heard this like a, a number of years ago. I remember someone saying this, that these trees, when they're together with other trees, they're so much stronger. And that's the importance, the importance of the community. The importance of unity of being together, and this parsha is always read right around Rosh Hashanah, either the week before or week after Rosh Hashanah. On Rosh Hashanah, we all stand for God in unity. There's an interesting phenomenon with with the the, the Jewish calendar and, and Rosh Hashanah. You know, in Israel. Generally, the holidays are one-day holidays. The first day of, Sukkot, of Passover is one day. Then you have the intermediate days. Shavuot is one day. Sukkot, one day. Simchat Torah, one day. And in the diaspora, outside of Israel, it's always two days. Right? And do we know the reason for that? Right. So there's a simple reason historically because in the diaspora, we weren't sure before we had the calendar set. We weren't sure what day was the first day of the month. Right? When was the new moon seen? Was it today? Was it tomorrow? Took time to 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 uh, to get that information out. So sometimes the time the holiday came, we still didn't know is it today or tomorrow. Right? We weren't sure what day on the calendar it is. So they so they kept two days. And interestingly, because of that, in Israel, the one holiday that we do keep two days in Israel is Rosh Hashanah. And the simple reason for that is because Rosh Hashanah is what day of the month? The first day of the month, right? The first day of Tishrei, the first day of the year. It's the first day of the month. So even in Israel, people didn't know whether it's today or tomorrow, right? Because even in Israel, they weren't able to get the word out. It was, it was today, right? So when is Rosh Hashanah? Is it today or tomorrow? We don't know. So we keep two days. So in the one holiday that it just so happens to be that in Israel and in the diaspora, we're keeping together the same amount of time is Rosh Hashanah, which emphasizes the idea of unity, the importance of unity when it comes to the new year, when it comes to the day of judgment. God wants to see more than anything else, unity. We're all getting together. Every morning when we start our prayers, what is the first thing that we say? I hereby uh, take upon myself, I accept upon myself the beautiful mitzvah of Ahavat Yisrael. Love your fellow as yourself. Because as a parent, what do you want to see? You want to see, page 12, <laughs> what you want to see is unity. Like all your children are getting along. So there's a beautiful story where there were the Hasidim, the disciples of the Magadim is rich. They were sitting around, they were having a farbrengen. They were sitting around, they were talking, they were schmoozing, saying, you know, singing songs. And suddenly, someone comes in crying. 
And they're crying that their daughter is really ill, felt ill, very sick. The doctors have given up hope. They don't know what to do. He's crying. And he's begging his friends, please give, give her a blessing. Give her a blessing for health. And his friends, although they were friends, they felt this was a little bit out of place. They said, we should give a blessing. Who are we to give a blessing? Go to the Rebbe. Go to the Magad of Mizrich. Holy man. He has a strong you know, connection up, up in heaven. He can give you a blessing. We should, ordinary people, we should give you a blessing. What's, what's it worth? Right? So while they were having this discussion, one of the other disciples, I think it was the Alter Rebbe, but one of the other disciples says, wait, wait, wait. Do we not remember? Do we not remember what we were told by the Magid that what a Farbrangan, what Jews coming together and wishing each other well, what that could accomplish? Even the great Malach Michal, the great angel Michal, the great angel Michael, even he cannot accomplish. When other people are wishing each other well out of her brain, it can accomplish so much more. It's like a father who sets rules. And if someone mis misbehaves, if someone does not follow the rules, they don't get whatever they're supposed to get, right? That's the rule. And when the child comes and says, please, daddy, I'll be good. Please give me. It's, no, rule is rules, right? You didn't clean up your mess. You didn't do your homework. You didn't do well with school. Blah, blah. You don't get you don't get this right. You don't deserve it. That's the rule. You have rules in order to implement them. But then, but then, when you have other, when you have other children, the 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 the, the, the siblings, they come to the father and says, "Please, let Josh have a, you know he really tried hard, right?" When the family comes together, when the siblings come together, now they're advocating for their siblings. Oh, the father has a change of heart. I said, you know what? Maybe. Maybe I could overlook it. Maybe I could move around. I could pull some strings, right? So when we when we bless each other, when we're asking, when we're praying for each other, that's what God says, wow, look, my children are together as one unit. I can give that blessing. That's the importance of praying for each other. And I think this is very well uh, you know, seen in, in this mitzvah, in this week's parsha, the mitzvah of writing a Torah scroll, which today is, is, is fulfilled to its, to its uh, you know, the, in its best way through being part of a community. It's all it takes. It doesn't cost thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. They don't have to fly to Israel to pick you know, the best you know, apartment and then get a good sofa. And then the, that's all it is. Just sign up to be part of the community. You don't even have to pay anything. Just be part of the community, right? It doesn't cost. It's not about paying my membership. It's not about paying dues. It's not, it's not how, how, how we get involved in the community. On the contrary, you can pay dues to a synagogue and never show up. Are you part of the community because you're on the list? Because it says your name, that I'm a member of this community? Or does a member of a community mean I am an actual active member? I show up. This is my place. This is my family. This is... My extended family, right? This is this is this is where this is my place. That is what it means to be part of a community, to be actively involved in a community. Not that you're right. It doesn't cost any money. It doesn't cost any money. Just it, all it costs is some time of participation. That's all it is. And it, and and we just found out today, and that's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah to be part of the community because it's a mitzvah of writing a Torah scroll, and it's a mitzvah of unity. And of course, before Rosh Hashanah, that's all we want more is to ask Hashem to give us a good year, Shana Tova, Umatuka, a happy and sweet, a good and sweet new year. When we say sweet, we want sweet, not just sweet where God has to explain to us that this is really sweet. We don't want that type of sweet. We want sweet where we could taste that it's sweet. Right? I once heard the reason why we dip an apple in honey on the night of Rosh Hashanah is because we want a sweet new year, right? But what's a sweet new year? What's sweet? So ultimately, we, we, we're, we're believers in God, and we trust in God, and anything that happens, we all know it's for the good. So God's going to tell us, you thought that this terrible thing is terrible? That's nah, really sweet. You don't get it, right? So what do we tell God? I don't want your sermons. I don't want to have to study and, 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 and understand and use my faith 
that it's sweet. I want, I want, I want to feel, I want to feel the sweetness. So an apple is naturally sweet. Honey comes from a bee, which things, right? So it's not, it doesn't feel sweet, but it produces honey. So what we're asking God is that our year should be like an apple, naturally sweet, where we feel sweet. And even the stings of a bee shouldn't feel like a sting. We should feel the honey. We should only feel the sweetness of all areas in life. It should only be like something that we actually could, could feel how this is sweet. And uh, maybe for all of us, thank you for joining us. And looking forward to seeing you next week.